But uh, uh, moving beyond that, there are issues of clopidogrel variability response, sometimes referred to as resistance, that seem to be uh, important in terms of predicting future clinical events. Now, there might be something we can do about clopidogrel uh, lack of responsiveness, such as increasing the dose of clopidogrel, in this case going from a loading dose of 300 to 600. As you can see, that shifts these curves over such that the percentage of patients that are on this end, hyporesponsive, is less. So potentially just playing around with the dose of clopidogrel could decrease ischemic events, and, and this has been tested prospectively now in a trial that was just published in the past uh, week or so in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Kern Oasis 7 trial, that randomized about 25,000 ACS patients to either higher dose clopidogrel or standard dose clopidogrel, high dose meaning a 600 milligram load, 150 milligrams for a week, and then the 75 milligrams a day versus a 300 milligram load followed by 75 a day, which is the FDA-approved dose. There's also a randomization to aspirin in a factorial design, low-dose and high-dose aspirin, low-dose meaning 81 milligrams a day, essentially, and high-dose meaning 325 milligrams a day. So two separate but important parts of the trial examining higher-dose clopidogrel and two different doses of aspirin. And the overall trial, and it's a little bit complex interpreting this trial, it was published simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine and in Lancet. I don't think I've ever seen that happen before. And in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, it was billed as a negative trial, both by the editorialist and uh, by the um, abstract of the paper. But in the Lancet, it was essentially billed as a positive trial, both by the authors and the editorialist. So th there's room for interpretation, and, and I guess everybody can walk away a winner. You can interpret this either as a positive or negative study. But I interpret it, I think, as all clinical trials should be, as useful information that should be integrated into the prior body of knowledge. And Overall, for aspirin, uh, there was no significant difference between aspirin doses. Uh, but with respect to clopidogrel dosing, it turned out uh, that in the cell of patients in this factorially designed trial who got higher dose aspirin and higher dose clopidogrel, they had the lowest rate of ischemic events with a statistically significant interaction term and a statistically significant finding in that particular cell of the factorial design. And that's a pretty complex statement if you don't uh, totally understand factorial designs and interaction terms. But shown pictorially here uh, is what I think the core findings of the study are. And in those patients, about 70% or so of the trial that went on to undergo angioplasty and stenting, as is common in acute coronary syndrome patients, the best results were seen. The lowest rates of stent thrombosis and ischemic events overall was seen in those patients getting the higher dose of clopidogrel and 325 versus a baby aspirin. As I mentioned, that was a statistically significant finding. So uh, perhaps in the stented patient, that's the best regimen if one is using clopidogrel. Let me move on now to trials that are specifically testing, though, the concept of tailored therapy. So in that last trial I mentioned, everybody either got or did not get the higher dose of clopidogrel. But maybe we should be using point-of-care platelet testing and deciding whether patients are responders or non-responders, and then tailoring therapy, personalized therapy as it's called, such that non-responders either get a standard dose of clopidogrel or the double dose of clopidogrel. And the Gravitas trial is ongoing. It's examining clinical events at six months and will be presented two months from now at the American Heart Association uh, meeting by Matt Price. So we'll actually have an answer to this question. If this trial is positive, well, that would be practice changing. We probably all should be measuring point of care platelet assays in patients that are undergoing percutaneous coronary intervention. And if it's negative, it really calls into question whether any of this clopidogrel resistance stuff matters in a way where we can influence therapy. Certainly, it predicts risk if a patient's clopidogrel resistant. But uh, can we do anything about it? That's the real question. There have also been genetic variations that have been identified, in fact, uh, by my colleagues at the Timmy Group uh, that seem to carry a higher risk of ischemic events in patients treated with clopidogrel, specifically uh, carriers of a reduced function allele of CYP2C19 that uh, affects the metabolism of clopidogrel in the liver. Uh, those carriers have a threefold excess of stent thrombosis versus non-carriers with treatment with clopidogrel. So again, much like platelet reactivity, if you carry these genetic polymorphisms, you're sort of uh, out of luck. I mean, it's, it's really a risk marker, and numerous studies have reproduced this. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, just published a few weeks ago, also in New England Journal of Medicine, from the CURE study I showed was a genetic analysis that didn't show any effect of these genetic polymorphisms on the benefit a patient derives from clopidogrel versus placebo. So a bit of a disconnect, clearly a risk factor, but not clearly a modifiable risk factor. Well, let me move on now to prazogrel, which was FDA approved uh, uh, actually not so uh, long ago. And, and this is a more efficient version of clopidogrel, basically more rapidly absorbed, more efficiently metabolized, such that more active metabolite gets to the ADPP2Y12 receptor. At this receptor level, there's really little difference between clopidogrel and prazogrel, but there is a pretty large difference between ingested clopidogrel and prazogrel in terms of active metabolite levels. So that's the key difference. And in the Triton Timmy 38 study, again uh, done by my colleagues here in town, a uh, significant reduction in ischemic events, the same triple ischemic endpoint, cardiovascular death and eye stroke, reduced with prazogrel versus clopidogrel, about a 2% absolute 20% relative risk reduction, highly statistically significant. So this is prazogrel versus an active control of clopidogrel in patients with acute coronary syndromes undergoing stenting. Now, if we had superimposed the CURE trial here with placebo, if you recall, there was uh, about a 20% relative risk reduction for placebo, uh, rather for clopidogrel versus placebo. So in fact, these results for prazogrel, had it been a placebo control trial, would have been even more impressive. On the downside, however, there was definitely more bleeding uh, with uh, prazogrel versus clopidogrel, a significant increase in major bleeding and life-threatening bleeding, and also a significant increase in fatal bleeding from 0.1 to 0.4% uh, with prazogrel. Not uh, statistically significant, not high event rates. This is one in 1,000 patients versus four in 1,000, but still concerning because it is fatal bleeding. And concerning, too, because it's a randomized clinical trial, always a bit of a sanitized population. I always worry that in real-world practice that those numbers might be higher. Also leading to a black box warning, a significant excess in intracranial hemorrhage in those patients with prior stroke or TIA in whom prazogrel shouldn't be used. And this really leads to the dilemma in antiplatelet therapy. Certainly more seems to be better but it does appear that intensifying platelet inhibition is a bit like navigating between psyllin and charybdis in as much as higher bleeding seems to also be an inescapable part of that. And there are trials that are going on to try to decrease the bleeding that was seen with prazogrel, such as the Trilogy ACS trial that Duke is doing, taking about 10,000 patients and randomizing them to clopidogrel or prazogrel. These are patients that are medically managed for their acute coronary syndrome, including a, about a quarter of those patients, 2,500 or so, that are elderly, uh, meaning uh, over the age of 75, where a lower dose of, of uh, prazogrel will be used uh, and also in underweight patients, a lower dose of prazogrel will be used. So this is an attempt to improve the risk-benefit ratio of prazogrel, not using genotyping or point-of-care testing, but using phenotype, that is reducing the dose of prazogrel in the patients that are most likely to bleed, the elderly and the underweight. Uh, the final ADP receptor antagonist I'm going to mention is ticagrelor, not yet FDA approved, though the FDA is uh, considering this agent. Uh, and this is a direct-acting ADP receptor antagonist. So unlike uh, clopidogrel or prazogrel or, or ticlopidine, uh, this uh, doesn't require any sort of in vivo biotransformation and binds directly to the ADP receptor. So it's not a thionopyridine. It's reversible and not irreversible, such as aspirin, clopidogrel, ticlopidine, prazogrel, so a, a very different mechanism of action, though generally speaking still working on the ADP receptor. It was studied in a large trial, 18,000 patients with acute coronary syndromes, the PLATO trial, randomized to, for the most part, standard dose clopidogrel, though there were some patients that got a 600 milligram loading dose of clopidogrel, versus ticagrelor, followed for up to 12 months, and the same triple ischemic endpoint that all these trials use. And what was found for ticagrelor versus clopidogrel was a very significant reduction in this triple ischemic endpoint. <clears throat> so much like prazogrel, a more potent agent is reducing important ischemic events. But um, unlike what was seen in that trial, in the overall trial, there was also a significant reduction in cardiovascular death as a standalone endpoint for ticagrelor versus clopidogrel and also a significant reduction in all-cause mortality for ticagrelor versus clopidogrel. Again, not a placebo control trial going up against an active control. So I think those results are pretty impressive. <clears throat>
As far as overall major bleeding is defined in this trial, no significant difference. Overall transfusions, no significant difference. Though teasing that apart a little bit, consistent with all other trials of antiplatelet therapy, if one looks at major bleeding not associated with surgery, uh, there there was a significant excess for ticagrelor versus clopidogrel. A similar proportion is seen with prazigrel versus clopidogrel or clopidogrel versus placebo. However, interestingly, in those patients that underwent bypass surgery, there there was no significant difference, but a numerically lower rate of bleeding with ticagrelor versus clopidogrel. So perhaps the reversible nature of this agent has led to the fact that there's less bleeding. Uh, I'm just going to mention Kangler briefly. It's probably not relevant to this non-interventional cardiology audience, but this is an intravenous ADP receptor antagonist. It was studied in two phase three trials, um, and uh, one trial uh, going up against 600 of clopidogrel actually didn't show superiority, but it did show non-inferiority. Uh, another trial going against placebo also failed to show superiority, but did show reductions in death and stent thrombosis. And, uh, potentially, these reductions in stent thrombosis and mortality uh, may lead to a, another trial of Kangalore, though that remains to be seen. Uh, the final compound I'll mention, or class of compounds, is a thrombin receptor antagonist being studied uh, in two large phase three trials. Uh, this uh, separate mechanism of action potentially could be an incremental or a substitute for ADP receptor antagonism. So to conclude then, dual antiplatelet therapy is indicated for at least a year after acute coronary syndromes and or PCI. Uh, multiple randomized clinical trials and the guidelines support that. There's a potential benefit beyond a year in patients with acute coronary syndromes and there's subgroup data from Charisma that supports that. And indirectly, the Triton study supports that because that was a 15-month study, not a 12-month study. And finally, novel agents are being evaluated and appear to reduce ischemic events, but of course have the potential to increase bleeding. So as we consider which agents to use in which patients, uh, that's something that needs to be foremost in our minds. Thank you very much for your attention.